Good evening, everyone. My name is Anakshi Sopti. I'm the CEO of the Asia Society India Center. For those of you who are joining us for the first time today, Asia Society is a leading educational organization dedicated to building awareness about art and culture, business, policy, technology, and education from across Asia on a global stage. At the India Center, our cultural programming is committed to recognizing and foregrounding the diversity of contemporary art, literature, museums and archives, and regional artistic traditions, not just from India, but from across South Asia. Keep following our website and social media handles to stay updated on upcoming and previous programs. Today, I'm delighted to welcome all of you to an exciting discussion around journalist and film critic Uday Bhatia's debut book, Bullets Over Mumbai, Satya and the Hindi Film Gangster, published by HarperCollins India. This book provides an account of Ram Gopal Varma's truly iconic film, Satya, giving us a behind the scenes view of the film, the context in which it was made, the cinematic traditions it is drawn from, and the legacy it has left behind. If you haven't ordered your copy, please go ahead and order it right now. It, it, it truly is an interesting read. Uday will be in conversation with Ranjini Mazumdar, Professor of Cinema Studies at Jawaharlal Nehru University. Ranjini is the author of Bombay Cinema, an archive of the city, and has also worked as a documentary filmmaker. Her current research focuses on globalization and film culture, and the intersection of technology, travel, design, and color in 1960s Bombay cinema. Together, the panelists will delve into the making of the book and some of the ideas it uncovers. The program is the second in an ongoing series titled Beyond the Ordinary Library Series with Asia Society, which spotlights diverse literary voices and worlds from across South Asia. The first season of the series is developed in collaboration with HarperCollins Publishers and focuses on extraordinary non-fiction writing from India. Before we proceed, a bit of housekeeping. We'll end the program with a Q&A session, but we encourage you to post questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen throughout the program. For our audiences on Facebook, please drop your questions in the comment section. We will try our best to answer as many questions as we can. I'd like to thank all of you for tuning in during what I imagine is a very busy pre-Diwali week. A very big thank you to HarperCollins for partnering with us on season one of our new series. Wishing all of you a very happy, safe and festive Diwali. Ranjini, over to you. Thank you, Inakshi. I'm going to start with a brief response to the book and then we will um, continue with our conversation. So first of all, Uday, congratulations on this remarkable book, which deals with a major Hindi language gangster film, Satya, alongside a vivid history of the depiction of crime in urban space in cinema before and after Satya. The book documents and analyzes how the film was made and how it should be viewed in the history of popular cinema. It also locates Satya as a significant moment in the history of crime films. Popular film histories have often tended to focus on either directors or stars. In this book, we are provided a detailed archeology span of how different kinds of film practitioners became crucial to the making of a film like Satya. Gangster films tend to be located in major cities of the world, especially if they are port cities like Bombay. They tend to be topical, draw on newspaper headlines, and the sensational life of crime that exists and circulates as urban legends and rumors. The genre combines a performative masculinity with the presence of deviant women, street action, and violence. There is often a recognition that romance is impossible. At the same time, we see the depiction of intense male friendships alongside tales of betrayal and revenge. Yet at the core, the gangster film is about a clash between legitimate and illegitimate modes of social existence. The films often provide social commentary on the nature of urban existence, alienation, and the brutalization of everyday life. In this book, Uday manages to provide a really detailed account of how the world of actual urban crime enters the landscape of, uh, enters the landscape of cinema through stories, events, rumors, and the actual brush with gangsters in particular locations. 
It is through the gangster genre that we as audiences often access the movement of crime in the city. This is a riveting book that everyone should read to see how certain films become marked by their time. In Uday's account, the process involved in the making of the film becomes as important as the final product we see on screen. This is a process that Uday excavates vividly for his readers as a journey full of surprises, struggles, chance encounters, murderous events, and also aesthetic choices. Congratulations again. Let me start by asking you a question about how and why you decided to focus on a film like Satya, and why was it important to place it within a longer history of crime films? Uh, thank you, uh, Ranjini. Uh, I'd like to say at the start that uh, your book on Bombay cinema was uh, very helpful to me in the writing of this. So I'm very glad to be talking to you about uh, my book. Um, uh, why Satya is... Um, uh, perhaps uh, two-pronged in the sense that I was a fan of the film earlier uh, when I first saw it, but I was uh, perhaps not as aware of its importance until I started uh, watching cinema a lot more and started writing about it myself. And then I started uh, to realize that a lot of the roads uh, led back to Satya in the kind of cinema that I was watching then, the films of uh, Vishal, uh, Vishal Bhardwaj, Anurag Kashyap, Tikmanshu Dhulia, a lot of them just, they, they all seem to sort of have strands that in the end, the origin point uh, seemed to be Satya. And uh, that kind of got me interested in thinking of the film as like a, a very important moment, uh, even more than just, just a fine film, but a, a moment where something changed slightly uh, in the DNA of Hindi cinema. So that was something that I, I really wanted to write about. And uh, uh, it also seemed to me that it was a good way to write about a bunch of things that I was interested in. First of all, the uh, the making of a film that doesn't have too many big stars, uh, uh, but has a lot of talented people at the start of their careers. Uh, how do they come together? How do they interact with each other? Do they have... Uh, any consciousness of, of, of that they're doing something very different uh, while they're doing it. So I wanted to capture that aspect. Uh, I wanted to write a bit about the gangster film and I wanted to write about the city film. Uh, so, and Satya gave me an opportunity to do all these things. Um, uh, so that's, uh, I think, why, why I wanted to uh, focus on this film. Uh, as far as locating it uh, in a tradition of gangster films, again, uh, it's not necessarily that Satya was made with an eye to previous Hindi gangster films. They weren't really referenced. Like I heard more references to the to the Godfather and Goodfellas and films like that uh, from the makers of Satya rather than like say Parinda or something like that. But um, I think what those earlier films did and uh, I've gone back to like the Navketan Noirs of the 50s and uh, through then the 70s with the Amitabh Bachchan uh, anti-heroes and then through the 80s where we started making uh, bona fide gangster films. Uh, these kind of lay the ground uh, for uh, you know what would become the Hindi gangster film so even though uh, it started coming together very late relative to other countries. I think we only started making like proper gangster films by the end of the 80s. Uh, they had done a lot of the groundwork so Satya didn't have to sort of invent the genre then. Uh, so uh, that again I thought was important to try and see it uh, not only as something that was hugely influential on the cinema that came later but also something of, of a continuation with what came before. So one of the things that I found really exciting about the book was the, you know, it's a wide map of films that you mobilize around Satya, both from India and international films, well-known Hollywood films and European arts, art house cinema as well. So it almost seems like, you know, Satya is a collage of past, 
present and also alluding to a future. Uh, so the last chapter is talking about the Satya effect or what follows after the film. So when you draw on this kind of wide map, clearly in the investing in the, the chapter which deals with the making of the film and how the team came together, was there a lot of discussion about all these international references? Uh, because so much of the film is, you know, it's only when we read your book that we realize how the film was actually made. And, and, and it could have been a very different film if they had taken just one or two decisions differently. So I just want to know what the atmosphere was in relation to world cinema, the history of Indian cinema, and you can tell us a little bit about the tensions as well that you have captured so well in the book. There were uh, very few or actually no references to world cinema in relation to Satya from the people I spoke to. Uh, uh, there were a lot of references to mainstream Hollywood. Uh, so you got a lot of uh, Godfather, Goodfellas, uh, Indiana Jones came up. Uh, Ramu brought up uh, Guns of Navarone. Uh, uh, so a lot of classic Hollywood uh, and uh, a lot of um, uh, some recent Hindi cinema, but uh, very little uh, world cinema. And I think that's also perhaps indicative of that times. I think uh, a lot of Hindi film directors started referencing uh, world cinema and a lot of the audience also started getting aware to it when uh, when DVDs came into the market mm -hmm. and that was just a little bit after they had just started trickling in when Satya released so another like if you go forward another four or five years then I think you would start getting uh, uh, a lot more younger directors who then would say ah yes you know this is like inspired by Wong Kar Wai or, or Old Boy or something like that. Um, so not, not so much uh, world cinema though, but uh, you, by the time company comes out, for example, you can definitely see that sort of uh, kinetic um, uh, uh, Asian, East Asian kind of influence. And uh, perhaps that was like a, uh, an indication of the times that, that either, you know, Wong Kar Wai or a slight Michael Mann uh, feel uh, to company as opposed to Satya, which is a lot more straightforward. Uh, so I, I think even in those uh, four years, something uh, did change. Yeah, yeah. So one of the things that you, uh, that, um, a distinction you make in the book uh, is uh, between a gangster film and a city film. And you just referred to it uh, as well. Gangster films are also urban films. And but you, when you make the distinction between the city film and the gangster film, even within the city film, you make further distinctions, parallel cinema, the Amitabh Bachchan form. And, you know, so there is a kind of range that you mobilize. So in your opinion, I mean, I know what, what you are trying to allude to in the book, but I'd like our audience uh, to also get some sense of, in your opinion, what is it that was distinctly different in Satya in relation to an earlier urban imagination that was framed by crime films of the 50s, 70s? You know, what is it that changed in Satya? So uh, I, this was actually something that I was interested in, like right at the start, because I knew that Satya would have to be looked at in the gangster tradition, because mm -hmm. it is a gangster film that 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 was obvious to me. But uh, not many people had seen it in terms of it being a specifically Bombay film. And it is that. It's like if you move Satya to any other city, the film changes. You you cannot dissociate it uh, from Bombay, uh, which is why I wanted to look at films that had looked at Bombay in a realistic way, uh, which had actually engaged with the city, like the real city and not the as it were, um, in the past and, and see what Satya... Because... 
in terms of direct influence there really isn't much but they still again like as i was saying for the gangster film they kind of lay a groundwork for a certain kind of city that satya can then find itself uh, in uh, there, there was a line in in your book actually which i really liked a lot and you said that uh, i'm uh, i may not be quoting this exactly correctly but you you, you said that its success is uh, in its aesthetic strategy which establishes bombay as a giant garbage dump and uh, as, as someone who's lived in bombay for a while uh, i agree with that and uh, it's it, you sim- simply hadn't seen that bombay in a film that was fairly mainstream before so you'd mm-hmm. seen it in in things like uh, art satya or rak uh, which have which really did not have much hope uh, or intention of reaching a very large audience but satya wasn't that kind of thing it had songs uh, it had a lot of flashy action it it wanted to reach a wide audience and yet it had this very uh, sort of street level view of bombay which i thought was pretty unique uh, to it and then you see that being imitated a lot uh, but before that you hadn't seen this kind of strategy much yeah because um, uh, apart from this distinction between the city and uh, the gangster genre uh, there is a kind of fascination for the everyday the criminals are like regular people the gangsters in this film and uh, there's a line by ram gopal varma in the book that you have where he, he decides to uh, focus on the time between crimes between the action it, no before you actually participate in a criminal act what happens to a gangster in their kind of daily life this was quite unique about satya and this is something um that uh, becomes a uh particular focus uh, uh for ram ram gopal varma it was very important to capture it like this but you actually show in the book that this happened because of certain events that started after the shooting of the after they began shooting the film and i want you to sort of give us a sense of how important was improvisation and responding to what was happening around them at that point because this is also the peak of underworld activity in bombay at that time and satya was being made and i i i am asking this question also because there's such a fetishization in bombay about the bound script and how important it is to have the script how important it is to not divert from the original writing process but everything in this film changed in the course of the shooting everything was being transformed and that is what is unique to the film it is a film that happened along with all kinds of things so i wanted you to give us a sense of the events and the process and why this film is an event more than just a finished product on screen satya may have been the least bound script ever uh... made into a hindi film because it just everything changed as you said uh, the the event uh, was the uh, killing of uh, of of gulshan kumar uh, by underworld hitmen uh, which happened uh, a couple of days into the shooting of satya they had just started and gulshan kumar who at that time was a huge player in bollywood uh, was shot and uh, the after that uh, uh, shooting stopped on satya for a couple of days uh, while ramu was trying to figure out what to do uh, you know and uh, he he started thinking in terms of uh, how the the gulshan kumar's killers must have felt on that day <clears throat> and what they did uh, what did they have for breakfast uh, what did their mother say to them before they were leaving the house after the murder like did they uh, did they go and grab a bite somewhere did they meet their girlfriend and he said that that event sort of gave him a clue as to how he wanted his uh, film to be uh, and so not not just to look at crime as this sort of um, in, in a very um, 
quote unquote filmy way but to treat it as just one part of these people's lives and then there are all these other aspects and uh, so that was a huge uh, event that happened uh, very early on in satya even though there was a script before and they had i mean things were sort of in place but that sort of changed the whole tenor uh, of of how he wanted to proceed so uh, the this uh, there are moments in the book they are very fascinating uh, you feel that this is a film that is walking a very tight rope the 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 production process because there there, there is research involved in the in the shooting where they are selecting locations and you the the obviously the crew had uh, people who knew gangsters who knew, knew neighborhoods uh and that's how the selection was going on uh, so you you almost feel that this you're right that this film couldn't have been shot in any other city except bombay but it is also because you needed the gang they needed the gangster world to play a role even in a film like this so there is a kind of strange movement between the underworld and cinema that takes a certain form in both satya and company but satya was the beginning so i just wanted your thoughts on that how important it is to be very close to this other world it, it there was that sense and obviously gulshan kumar's killing kind of brought it home to people like how close they actually were uh, to to the underworld uh, that um, you know said that because before there had been attempts on uh, on some prominent uh, bollywood uh, uh, personality lives but they had never really uh, happened so this was like the first major uh, uh, killing uh, by the underworld and so uh, that brought it home but even on satya's crew there were people who at various levels had like one foot or maybe just one toe in the underworld uh, they maybe knew someone who knew someone uh who who could like get things done uh, they had to shoot in uh, uh, agripada so um, uh, they uh, again they got uh, the uh, lo- local don to sort of intervene there so that they get permission to shoot uh, a lot of uh, and uh, uh, there was um, uh, ajit devani who uh, who was not uh, pa- uh, officially credited but he's thanked and he helped a lot with locations and uh, getting access uh, to uh, to to talk to people for some research and again he was someone who had sort of slightly uh, shady li- links uh, mm-hmm. with the mob uh, bharat shah also later there were uh, allegations that you know he he had links with the underworld he had uh, financed some of his films with that uh, so uh, the satya may not have had a very direct link with the mob but it was made in its shadow as mm-hmm. i would imagine a lot of the films were at that time because financing was uh, kind of linked up with uh, with black money and and underworld money a lot at that time and just living in bombay also there was this was that period in which the underworld sort of had come above ground uh for a while like it wasn't that um unusual for you to know someone who knows someone who might be in a gang uh even if you're you you have like no connection to that life so uh, i think this it was just that time period also and and uh, i think there was also just that level of excitement that oh you know we are slightly close to danger and we are making this film so i think that also kind of helped the film in a weird way so uh, when you were writing the book you know this is a book that obviously you've done a lot of research you've spent a lot of time interviewing all these people and you know you've literally created an archive uh which we wouldn't have had access to without a book like this you know so you've actually documented a process very carefully so my question to you is how important is it uh to have access to the history of crime Uh, to write a book like this like the history of crime in bombay and how important was it that you are not actually a bombay resident 
well i was a bombay resident uh, for most of the research and uh, the writing of the book that that i thought was at least something i i had to do uh, for a couple of reasons a i had to meet a lot of people there and b i just i wanted to be in the city and sort of try and understand it a little bit um, so that i i could get uh, some idea of 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 uh, you know what what drives it uh and uh, in terms uh, uh, as far as uh, crime uh, understanding bombay crime is concerned i uh, i still have probably what is just a rudimentary knowledge i i, I tried to read up on uh, what was going on in the underworld in in the late 80s and and 90s in the years uh, leading up to this i was interested in in seeing uh, how uh the uh, the bombay uh, uh bombay mafia and the um, uh, hindi cinema sort of interacted uh, and those interactions were going on for some time now they uh, started uh, they started in the 70s actually they really started uh, they they grew in the 80s and then in the 90s they were uh, there was a lot of interaction i wanted to see where uh, you know where those intersections were happening and um, also the, it was just um, like the uh, because a lot of the dons had sort of gone abroad and they were looking at hindi films there uh, there was a sense that they were almost uh, mythologizing their own lives through hindi cinema because mm-hmm. they were funneling some of their money into that and that to me was very interesting so i don't think that Uh, quite happened on satya but i think when the gangster film really exploded after that you started seeing that happening in the early 2000s and uh, that was very interesting uh, uh, to, to sort of look at that period i thought like 2002 uh, to to 5 where there's still underworld involvement and there's a lot of like films being made on real life figures maybe just with the name slightly changed uh and perhaps with some of their funding also yeah no my question to you about uh, being an outsider is actually deliberate because you know all these filmmakers who confronted the city in their films are outsiders they're not people who grew up grew up in bombay because you know habitual relationships to any space makes you blind to that place as well you know and and here i you know something that you capture in your book and i think you know i also spoke to jared hooper who was one of the cinematographers for the film he came from an independent cinema tradition documentary so there was a kind of documentary um an imagination of a documentary realism that was at work in the, in a film like this because they were very aware of the space that they were trying to capture in the film that's what gave the film that particular visual design and and this come came because you know ram ramu himself was not a bombay person neither was anurag kashyap or saurabh shukla they were all outsiders to the city and i i i'm asking this question to you as well because when you were documenting for your book you you know you talked about so many very specific locations that were mobilized in the book so reading your book i get a sense of a a map a sense of the city its its neighborhoods the particular spaces where the films were shot and how they were connected to the underworld so this requires a certain kind of um, awareness of of that space so i don't know this is my feeling and this is something that these filmmakers have also said and the uh, uh, at least hooper definitely said that he was taken aback by the look of bombay and i can't forget when he told me that you know the wires the the electric wires hanging everywhere that was such a significant thing for him and you can see that in so many of the chase sequences in satya he's focused on that so there right. is this is a question about whether the aesthetic choices were made because they were outsiders and the way you wrote the book is also something that emerged from your outsider status perhaps it made me more sympathetic to noticing that they were all outsiders and 
uh, how they still made one of the quintessential Bombay films. Uh, mm-hmm. One, uh, two, uh, two outsiders that you didn't mention. Very interesting. One was, of course, Manoj Bajpayee. Mm-hmm. Of course, uh, 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 from uh, uh, Bihar, and uh, there, it, there's also Chakravarti, mm-hmm. and Chakravarti uh, was um, was I thought I thought the most interesting outsider uh, of the bunch because he was kind of he he, he speaks Hindi. Uh, slightly differently from everyone else in the film. Uh, like you know that he is from one of the southern states, even though we don't know where Satya is from because of the way Chakravarti speaks, we know that he's not like from the north and he's probably not from Bombay. And uh, that was deliberate. They, uh, Ramu did want that slight outsider uh, thing that he uh, he wanted his... Uh, his central character to come from somewhere else uh, to Bombay, uh, also perhaps reflecting uh, Ramu's own journey uh, uh, as someone who sort of came and then made a name for himself in Bombay, but mm-hmm. who started in Telugu cinema. So I, uh, the, there was that, it, but but it is interesting that the the first Hindi film that that. Uh, uh, at least the first original Hindi film, uh, apart from the remakes that that Ramu made, was Rangila, and at that time he had just about come to Bombay. He he hadn't. Uh, I don't think he had fully moved there. He just he made the film here, and that's a lot more concerned with the cinematic idea of Bombay. Uh, it takes place sort of half in in the city of Bombay and half in a sort of cinematic ideal of Bombay. And by the time of Satya, which is three years later, things have completely changed. He is seeing the city exactly for what it is. And that perhaps was uh, Ramu's uh, becoming somewhat of an insider by then, having like come and settled in Bombay and then actually understood the city. And you can see that difference between Rangila and Bombay uh, just in terms of how they view the city, uh, Rangila and Satya. Yeah. So the um, two terms that are recurring throughout your book, and they come, they emerge in various conversations, whether it's with Manoj Bajpai or with Ramu or Anurag. I mean, the way they were all thinking about the uh, film and what they wanted it to look like, two terms. It should be authentic and there should be, it should be realistic, you know. And then you actually, uh, your uh, second cinematographer, Mazhar Kamran, I think that's his name. Yes, yes. Um, so he says people think realism means place the camera in a location and just shoot randomly. And that's what realism is. But realism is actually a style. He actually draws attention to that. So there seems to be some kind of a contradiction here between authentic, the way people were talking about it, the way they were talking about uh, wanting to make a gangster film that was realistic. And each person is talking to this, talking about this or alluding to this. And then this overall style of the film, it's a highly stylized film. So I was wondering if you had something to say about this. I think they they found a, a, a nice mean between uh, uh, sort of like a very documentary style photography, which Satya is not. Uh, and uh, between that and say like the high style of Parinda, which mm-hmm. is like very, very stylized. And uh, uh, you can like, you know that that is a lot more polished, uh, uh, just like seeing a few frames as compared to Satya. Uh, but again, this is not, Satya doesn't look like Ard Satya. Which is just really raw and and it doesn't have too much style uh, to it. It's like a very uh, you know low budget, very grimy, gritty. And and Satya is uh, some of those things, but there is is a certain uh, stylishness to it. And uh, uh, this was uh, uh, something that uh, this was one of the the few things that Ramu did communicate clearly to uh, Gerard Hooper and Mazhar Kamran that he wants it. Uh, to look realistic and uh, it is to his credit that he found two cinematographers both of whom had 
a, a background in in documentary uh, as opposed to fiction uh, mm-hmm. and uh, he hadn't done that before with any of his mm-hmm. films and so he he had an inkling that he wanted it to look different from any of his earlier ones because even his earlier gangster action films they are extremely stylized uh, much more than satya if you look at um, antham or you look at shiva uh, those films are very, uh, very stylized raat shanam shanam uh, and satya is a lot more straight forward uh, so i think he he wanted that uh, he wanted to capture bombay as honestly as he could without like putting off viewers who would be like oh you know this is like a films division news reel we don't want to watch it so, so i think he got just the exact amount of realism that could still get into a lot of theaters and people would watch it yeah the other thing that is very significant in your book is that this narrative of um realism or authenticity uh translates into the way in which language is used in the film so you know i mean there are very interesting tensions that you capture that uh um the language of course is bombaya that's what the gangsters are speaking and al- also people like manoj bajpayee are improvising and picking up things and um ensuring that they carry something of what they feel is uh the correct way of depicting that language and that that's something that you capture in the book but then you also have a very interesting analysis of sapne mein milti hai the song that was uh, performed at that wedding which is a punjabi song and there was a whole uh, conflict amongst the uh, crew about how can you have a punjabi song in a marathi wedding so yeah. can you say something about this because the obviously the notion of the authentic is instrumental when you want it you use it when you don't you don't because you actually don't need it the, that song worked beautifully in the film so there's a there's a simple explanation for why there was that punjabi song there uh, in in marches um, which is a film set in punjab uh, uh, by by gulzar uh, vishal bhardwaj had composed the music for that also and it was very popular he had composed sapne mein milti hai for that film uh, and he t- he took the composition to uh, gulzar sahab and uh, uh, gulzar was like uh, maybe you can do better so he uh, tried again and he came up with chappa chappa charka chale which landed up in the film so he just had this song with him and he hadn't used it uh, since then and uh, ramgopal varma then when he was making satya he asked vishal that i have this wedding sequence do you have a song that will fit and uh, vishal was like you know i had this thing that uh, was there like a few years back but it's in punjabi do you want to hear it and he heard it and ramu said yeah yeah this is great and <laughs> he said no one will care that it's in punjabi which is absolutely uh, true because uh, the the one rule of of films uh, at least hindi films is that anyone anywhere a set like wherever it's set in india they can break into a punjabi song and no one is ever going to question it yeah that's true and and that moment that is there in the the fact that this is a a, a song that wasn't used in another film and so it traveled to satya and then becomes a very big hit uh, as part of this film and i wanted to know something i wanted you to share with uh, our audience a little bit about the other song uh, uh, mama kallu mama uh, the the other song um, is it, is that the song uh, uh, bheja phir uh, that holi mar bheje me holi mar bheje me so yes, uh, yes. that was also uh, highly debatable in the uh, amongst the crew members they all had arguments about whether they should use that song or not yeah uh, the the weird thing is that uh, gulzar who is like 20 years senior uh, to everyone else he had the right instincts on that which is that you have to have aggressive language you need to say goli mar bheje me uh, it needs to be the kind of song that gangsters would sing 
uh, if and uh, but everyone else was slightly taken aback and they uh, they they were uh, <laughs> they they were uh, unfortunately they were they, they were too scared to uh, tell gulzar that his lyrics won't work uh, so uh, he's uh, so, so they got kashyap to try and approach gulzar which he did and uh, gulzar just shooed him away and finally they just recorded that and they used it and of course that became very important for the film because um, uh it it sort of uh, as as the music used to in in those days it released like uh, a couple of months in advance and that was the primary publicity in those days trailers weren't so big that day uh, in those days as music videos and uh, goli mar bheje me and uh, gila gila pani and uh, sapne mein milti hai they all became really popular and people got to know the film uh, uh, uh through those um and uh, it built some initial excitement for it yeah so um you know uh, film and well known films and important films uh, the films acquire a significance and a um in the history of cinema over a period of time so we are now almost uh, it's almost 23 or 24 years since satya was made uh, it was also released the year kuch kuch hota hai was released uh, and i i believe and this is legend i've heard that ramu went into serial depression because kuch kuch hota hai got all the film fair awards and satya got nothing except for some editing and um, maybe music and that's that caused a real crisis for him So, you know, so when I, uh, when I, when you think about this, the the significance of a film like Satya, how important it is, is it to uh, see it as a kind of archival document? And if it is an archival document, what is it that it is? What is it um, archiving of the city, a city that is not there in Kuch Kuch Hota Hai? but it's a very different kind of city what do you think it is archiving i think maybe on two levels one it's just capturing the city of bombay at a time when the underworld was still um quite prominent uh, people nowadays may not be able to relate to those uh, to those times when it was uh, a lot more visible uh, in people's everyday lives uh and capturing maybe a specific world but even then uh quite um, you know you you can relate to the uh, t- uh, just to uh, the the way they they go out on dates and uh, the uh, the uh, uh, ganesh chaturthi celebrations and also they it captured quite a wide spectrum of the city even while concentrating on on this specific world i think also in terms of archiving i think it's a, it's a very interesting archive of hindi cinema at a time when it was just changing uh, you had all these people working in here who would go on to have uh, very important careers going forward uh, also at that time uh, hindi film had just got industry status uh mm-hmm. it's uh, digital editing had just come in and satya was one of the earlier films to get uh, e- edited uh, half digitally and and half on on a steam deck uh th- so a lot of things were changing uh, on a technological level also uh you can see a mobile phone in satya uh it's sort of uh, that moment is also captured so i i think it uh, kind of uh is is now if you look back at it you can see uh, a city uh, at the uh, end of the 90s and also a film industry that was in the process of changing and uh, it was perhaps like a film like satya if it was made a couple of years later probably would not have had songs uh that it was made in 1998 that it needed those songs even though perhaps the first instinct was to go without songs is again uh, a window into the thinking that was there at that time that even a film like satya uh, would need those few songs to sort of be successful which was the case one of the things that you say that uh, 
for you when you watched, uh, I don't know how old you were when you watched Satya first, but when, you, when you're writing, you talk about how for you, the music track, the soundtrack is a bit loud uh, and that you wished Ramo had kept the sound a little muted the, and, the score, and yes. allowed silences to play an important role. And yet when the film was released uh, and they showed, uh, you captured that whole uh, discussion of how uh, the film was screened for many industry people without the music. And everyone said, it's not working. The film is not working. And then after the music was added, and there is a considerable work done on the soundtrack. Um, and it's hypo, there is a kind of hyperbolic quality to the soundtrack. It is the music that actually played a very important role in this film. So in, in some senses, there is something unique about this film because it, as you said, it relies on songs, it relies on music, and it has a particular kind of address for an Indian audience. Because I remember I showed it to uh, an American academic who was who just dismissed it and said, this can't be a gangster film, it's a musical. So there was a kind of genre crisis for him because the film uses song. And yet without the music, the film doesn't work. So what are your thoughts on this? So the most... Uh emphatic uh, illustration of what you just said uh, maybe it came from uh, uh, Mazar Kamran mm -hmm. who saw cut of the film an early cut of the film without uh, without music with the rest and the sound but but no music and he he it, he, it wasn't really working and he and he told uh, Ramu that you know I don't know I, I, it just doesn't feel right to me and Ramu said hear it with the with the music later and he did, and he said it was completely different. And I can believe that. Uh, I have a few reservations about Sandeep Jota's score simply because it's like really loud and uh, loud scores are, uh, mm -hmm. I, I have a problem with them, but then that is like all of Hindi cinema. So, you know, you can't really uh, do anything about that, but it's also really effective in a lot of places, like uh, the uh, the opening flute themes, which comes in, is is great, and and sometimes he he does like really subtle things, like when Bhau is approaching uh, their um, to coming to sort of mend fences temporarily, they, it just has this sort of uh, tense thing, like there's these taps at a tabla, uh, mm -hmm. it's very subtle, but it sort of creates this tension, uh, so. I, I think it's a very effective score that perhaps is just a bit too loud for me at times. But uh, otherwise, I think, yeah, it probably works. Um, and uh, as far as Vishal's soundtrack is, I think everything is everything works fine, except uh, Tu Mere Paas Bhi Hai, which is just not a... That seemed like the biggest concession to popular cinema that just did not work like they, they, no one is convinced about that song They're not the people in it even the the tune isn't uh, anything special like no one has any conviction about it and it's just been put in uh, because they needed like n number of songs I think. okay now let me go to the chat for q a section and let's see what kind of questions we have um so there's a question from an anonymous attendee. I'm curious about the relationship between films and cities. In this case, Satya and Bombay. Many films would be set, could be set anywhere, but you can't imagine Satya set in any city except Bombay. What makes a cinematic city? I think you've answered this question, uh, talked about it, but if you want to add something. Uh, no, I'd actually, I'd like to ask you because uh, you've written, uh, you've written the definitive book on on Bombay as a, a cinema city. Uh, what what do you feel makes uh, a cinematic city, and and uh, what is it about Bombay? Uh, I don't know. I'm so far removed from that book now. I wrote it 14 years ago. It came out 14 years ago. It seems like a really long time. And I'm not a resident of Bombay. But I, um, 
I think the uh, cinematic city, I don't make the distinction always between the idea of a real city and a cinematic city. We only know cities now through their mediated forms. And so both forms move into each other. And that's something actually you capture very well in your book that there is no authentic outside city from the cinematic city. They merge together and it's the way we know cities of the world, whether it's New York, London, Tokyo, Bombay, whatever, you know, Calcutta. These are all cities that are highly mediatized spaces. So we know them through that. So um, for me, it is, you know, there are different ways in which cinematic cities have uh, emerged uh, and they can be through genre structures. Um, but just also the kind of stories that travel into these films. So the industry that makes the films, they need to have a sensibility of the city. That's what will travel into the film world. And that's something that happens in, in your book a lot because you can see all these practitioners are living in all kinds of places in the city and they bring their own experiences into the films. And it's also impromptu, you know, this is how it's the language is spoken. This is the kind of space we need to go to. Uh, right. So all that actually plays a very important role. So there is no one formula, but yeah. some sensibility has to be there. And that again is, that's why it's, it's helpful that you have people who are at the start of their careers who are not from Bombay and so they are like I, so many times when I was just talking to people, they'd be like, oh, you know, I, I stayed in a in a house just like this one, three people to one room. And, um, you know, I said, uh, it's Manoj Bajpai, when he wanted to figure out how Bhikkhu speaks, uh, he, he started listening to the cook who came to his to his house and he, he, he started to pick up, uh, you know, her her lingo. And try and mix that with what he had he had also heard on the street. So, if you are in those, maybe not exactly the kind of uh, environment that the characters are in, but if you're in something that is, you know, in that ballpark, you're always going to be able to get like a more authentic sort of film, which uh, which sort of worked out for them. Okay, so we have a question now. Uday, you write. Uh, popular short form pieces regularly, but this is your first book. Can you talk a bit about your process for both? Did you have to reorient yourself? Uh, yeah, so I'm uh, I, I'm I mostly uh, write film criticism for 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 paper, uh, for newspapers. I'm with Mint Lounge at the moment. I was with Time Out earlier, uh, and uh, yeah, so those are mostly like seven, 800 words or at the most uh, 2,000, 3,000 words. So, and this was the first uh, thing that I, I picked up, which is anything close to this kind of length. And I think one of the main things that I had to sort of learn on the job as it were, was just um, learning to write uh, expansively. My uh, my thought process is mostly to write to a word count because I'm writing for print publication. So I know that this has to be these many words or so. And even if I'm writing like something that's going online, I usually sort of try and uh, my instinct is to try and get to the point uh, fairly quickly. Uh, in this, I sort of had to teach myself that, you know, you, you have to go into detail and you have to sort of unravel uh, things rather than getting to the point all the time. Otherwise, it's just it's it's just not going to work. So that was, I think, something that I had to learn over uh, the writing of the first draft itself. It sort of that dawned on me. Okay, as a film critic, who are some of your inspirations? Which film writers, both in India and internationally, do you admire? Okay, so um, internationally, uh, I started off by reading a lot of Pauline Kael, and I still uh, I still refer to her stuff a lot. Uh, she's a big inspiration. Uh, there's this British writer who lives in America now called David Thompson, 
I'm a big fan of his. There's an American writer called Jeffrey O'Brien. There is uh, Anthony Lane at The New Yorker. Um, so uh, yeah, the, I, and uh, I try and uh, sort of keep up with whatever is being written in sight and sound and film comment in a couple of these uh, magazines. Uh, as far as um, uh, any um, uh, Indian film writers are concerned, I, uh, again, when I was starting out, I read a lot of uh, J. Arjun Singh stuff. I read uh, Bharadwaj Rangan stuff. And uh, I, I now I, I keep up with pretty much uh, anyone who's, who's writing seriously about film. Uh, out here just to see like what they've said because we're often reviewing and writing about the same films and, and uh, TV series. Okay, so next question, very interesting. Are there any recent gangster films set in the city? There seems to have been a shift away from the city to rural India, Rais, gangs of Vasipur and so on. Why is that the case? So uh, I think uh, one thing was that reality just dictated that because the gangsters themselves uh, moved out of Bombay. Uh, uh, it uh, uh, went abroad or went underground and that kind of underworld that was there at that time in the 90s and, and maybe early 2000s just doesn't exist uh, anymore, uh, at least not visibly. Uh, so that that inspiration, uh, real life inspiration wasn't there. So that's why you saw a lot of the, the move away from Bombay. I think it was probably, you could say it started with uh, Tingman Shudhulia's films, uh, Hasil and so on. And uh, then uh, Sahib Bibi Gangster, Pan Singh Tomer and uh, Vishal's films, you had Omkara. And then of course, then on to Vasepur which was hugely successful. And then you saw a lot of vasipur like films after that. So I, I think it had a lot to do with the fact that the real life inspirations were gone. And maybe just also the fact that we made so many gangster films in such a short period of time after having really spread out the genre before that, like over 30 years, we made very few gangster films. And then suddenly we made a whole bunch of them uh, after uh, Satya became popular, that maybe the genre also was a bit played out. Like there wasn't much to say about uh, Bombay gangsters anymore. And they, people realized that, but if they move it to a different locale, they can bring in like a lot of different uh, speech rhythms, a lot of like cultural specificities, uh, which were not there in Bombay. And they sort of uh, took the, uh, that's why they moved it out. Mm. Because in the context of, you know, in the global context, you know, there is something called the idea of the city, which is a physical space. You can think about it in terms of, you know, well-known physical spaces of uh, well-known cities of the world. But the urban experience is beyond the city now. And that's to do with technology, with the, the movement of television, the internet, it's sort of gone all over to different kinds of spaces. That changes the ways in which we think about the physicality of city experiences. Mm -hmm. It's no longer located in a geographical space. It travels to other kinds of sites as well. And I think one of the reasons why this exploration of the heartland is because of the connections between the heartland and the city because of migration, uh, large scale migration into cities as well as the movement of information and uh, um, which the which these new technologies have made possible so yes. you can be anywhere in any uh, small town but you're connected you yes. are connected to a global world and, and that changes the way in which you think about those spaces and i think that may have also affected uh, the encounter with places like wasipur and Manchurulia's films and things like that. Okay. Um, could you talk a bit about the music? The lyrics in particular are interesting since they are so different from Gulzar's usual lyrical prose. Hmm. Uh, I think we covered this uh, pretty much in the conversation. Um, I'd, I'd just say again that uh, I think it's quite uh, amusing to me and uh, of course 
tribute to uh, Gulzar's instincts that he he knew that for like the main big loud song which is Goli Mar Bheje Me that he had to drop uh, you know what might have been his own uh, poetic idiom and put his reputation on the line uh, a bit and make something that was like very stark and very hard hitting. Uh, and he did that and it was successful. It was a bit of a gamble for him. And, uh, but, but it worked. And I think that's quite, um, quite nice of him to do that. Um, <laughs> and the reaction of the, the film crew, you know, kind of shows how uh, bold a decision that was on his part. Okay, why was border shown in the theater stampede sequence? Did Ramo have any special reason for it? Asking because of border screening actually had a stampede in a Delhi theater. Any connection? Actually, he yes. has a very nice section in the book on this. So mm-hmm. you, you may want to respond to this. Yeah. Yes, I'm very happy someone asked this because uh, there is a, there is a reason. And uh, again, this was... Uh, something that I'd gone in with a preconception of, I'm guessing what you're uh, thinking of is the Upahar uh, fire in Delhi, the, the reference that you're making and border was screening then. And uh, in that tragedy, a lot of people died. And then uh, the same thing happened, uh, there's a stampede here. And, uh, but no border apparently was not chosen because it was that film. It was chosen because Bharat Shah financed both these films and it was just available without having to pay anybody anything. So it was not a reference. At the same time, uh, it's difficult to imagine that a lot of viewers did not think of Upahar when they were watching Satya uh, of that, of the fire and the stampede when they were watching the same film getting interrupted and then there's a stampede in a theater. So um, yeah, I think maybe the, uh, Intention wasn't there, but the connection may still have been made by by audiences, even though it wasn't intended. Ramo is quite a maverick, larger than life persona. You must have had some preconceived notions about him because of all you heard. How was it eventually meeting him? Was he happy to talk about the film or was he tough to interview? Now let's get all the dirt on Ramo. (laughs) Um, he was initially not too happy to talk about the film. He said, I've, I've spoken about it so much. I've given, uh, I, I don't know if he was convinced of the seriousness of, of what I was trying to do also. So he may have just seen it as yet another interview about Satya. And um, so he was a little uh, reluctant at first. Uh, but as time sort of wore on, he was... Uh, he sort of started talking a little bit. I uh, I found that asking him about his earlier work, he was a lot happier to talk about. So his uh, work in Telugu cinema before uh, before he came to Bollywood, uh, he kind of opened up on that. And uh, when I showed him scenes uh, from the film um, on on my laptop, there uh, at that point he sort of started. Uh, uh, recalling a lot of stuff and he, he did have a lot to say. Uh, so I, I think once he started uh, speaking, he, he wasn't a tough interview, but it was just that he wasn't, uh, he wasn't very keen initially. And also he, he's uh, surprisingly self-effacing. He is not the kinds who was like, oh, you know, I, I planned this, I planned that, uh, that scene, I, I intended this. So he, I got a lot of oh, this just happened, or or we got lucky here, or, you know, I wasn't really planning this, but, you know, so-and-so came off well. And uh, this just went on through the thing. And uh, it it, it was interesting to me because we have this tendency to think that everything is is planned perfectly in, in a film that we like and that a lot of the things that we are reading into it were intended. Uh, but um, if if you take uh, his uh, Ra- Ramu's words um, uh, as as the truth, then um, a lot of it did come about by chance, and uh, or just by putting the right ingredients in place, and then you know things sort of landed. Uh, 
rather than them being like planned down to the last uh, detail so that is the one thing i uh, felt uh, you, you admire ramu considerably in the book that comes out also and whereas when i was doing my research i always felt that you know ramu was a great entrepreneur who knew how to attract very talented people are to him you know to be part of his projects because otherwise how do you explain the team departs and ramu collapses totally i mean in the recent past he hasn't made anything that uh, is even remotely close to what he produced in those days so it was really probably a collective uh experience and that's something that you capture very well in the book as well that there is no single person who can generate this kind of uh filmmaking filmmaking in any case is a collaborative process that comes out um uh, very well okay the last uh, not really a question but a comment here is i have no question but i just like to say that i love the cover it is so pulp and pops out very nice <laughs> That's I'll pass. Cool. I'll pass that on to the designer and the illustrator. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, any other questions? And do you want to respond to that point about Ramu? I, uh, I think that even I mean his his fall has been very dramatic. I I I don't know if we've really seen any other director uh-huh. go so completely off uh, the. Um, you know the, the 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 path that they were on but um, if you look at what he achieved in in the years from uh, from 1989 when he made siva till uh, uh, till sarkar which is 2005 uh, it's a remarkable career it's um, it's it's really one of the most uh interesting and i think uh, influential careers in in hindi cinema uh just in terms of uh the films that he's made at least uh, i i would say at least three of them probably three or four of them are are classics and uh, three or four more are just really very good films and uh, then his work as a producer uh, uh once he started uh, you know giving Uh, an opportunity to a lot of talented young people uh, that also kind of uh, really changed in the cinema the, the factory days where uh, between like say 98 and and 2005 uh, those were uh, very exciting uh, days for uh, for hindi cinema then and and the kind of people who came out to it it's quite mind boggling now you see so many directors cinematographers editors writers from that time and and it's it's just weird to think how many of them uh, ramu gave a start to in one of his films so i think uh, if you just look at what he achieved uh, that was probably enough even though it went uh, where it, like completely wrong after a point uh, but still i think he's he's done enough to be like right up there there are actually two more questions so these are the final two questions one is how did you deal with the inconsistency in all the rehashing of events by various cast and crew members uh, which you've written it also in that form uh, in the book and the second question let me just give give you the last question as well and then you can uh, respond to both the first chapter where you talk about the major scenes of satya is very well written it recaps the film for us who saw it a long while back are those your favorite scenes okay uh, as far as the inconsistency in the accounts are concerned i i decided i would just include all of them and uh, put them in front of the reader and let them decide because uh, i i thought it was a quite amusing that this film wasn't made that far back but still there were a lot of different recollections of a lot of events that you would think that everyone would have pretty much the same memory of uh some of them i could check so i i where i where i could i have sort of provided a little fact check while things are being narrated in the book uh, uh and where i i couldn't i have just uh put 
all the accounts in front of the reader and uh, uh, sort of tried to uh, give, uh, you know, uh, maybe a broad idea of what might have actually happened. But it didn't bother me too much. It was just uh, quite amusing to me, really, to, to see all the different accounts. Uh, and um, uh, thank you uh, for the uh, words about the first chapter. And uh, it, the idea, as, as you point out, it was to recap uh, the, the film for people who hadn't seen it. And uh, those weren't uh, necessarily my favorite scenes. Uh, I thought those were the scenes that I could write the most about uh, and pick up different aspects of the film. Uh, and uh, that's why I chose those 10. But some of them, of course, are just like some of the most important scenes in the film, like Mumbai Ka King Khan, or the, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the killing of Bhikkhu and stuff. So uh, it was, um, uh, sorry, killing of Bhau. Uh, so uh, yeah, not, maybe not all my favorite scenes, but the ones that were most useful in terms of reminding people what the film was about. So thank you there for writing this book. It's a great read and I hope all of you, some of you have clearly read it and those who haven't read it should get the book and read it. And thank you to Asia Society for helping us have a conversation uh, on a film that means a lot to many of us. And as Uday uh, does capture in this book, it is a, it's a film which has historical significance and Ramu will definitely be an important figure in the history of Indian cinema. And uh, for that reason alone, uh, and for really writing a book uh, that is um, uh, not only just great fun to read and access, but it is, it is really an archive uh, and which academics will also find very important because it, it forces you to think about filmmaking uh, in more, uh, in, in very direct ways. Uh, it, it, it makes you think about the internal dramaturgy that goes on with any kind of filmmaking. And we need to look at those uh, elements much more carefully and not just think about film as what's projected on the screen. And that's what Uday's book really captures for all of us. So thank you so much, Uday, for so much, writing much. this. And I hope the book is read widely. And thank you to Asia Society and to the uh, attendees uh, who have asked very good questions as well. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.